So this is the incident handling life cycle. For, this is also the same thing or sometimes also called the incident response life cycle. You know, if you're an incident responder or SOC analyst or, you know, incident response analyst, you're going to be using this like in sort of like a mental model for how to respond to incidents. It has this like sort of like cyclic nature to it. So it starts from preparation and then from preparation, you go to detection and analysis this is where you're actually doing like investigation and stuff like that. And then from there, you go on to containment, eradication and recovery. Those are actually like individual steps themselves, but sometimes you have to like go back from containment eradication and recovery back to detection and analysis like sometimes that process is cyclic as you find more evidence more data until you know you get to a point where you're like okay you know we found enough and then you then go into post incident activity and then from there post incident activity feeds back to preparation so what you learn from your post incident activity actually helps you become better at preparing for incidents when they might happen in the future so this is sort of like you know the i guess the standard like incident response uh, life cycle or you know i guess according to nist all right so as an incident handler or a stock analyst, we would aim to know the attacker's tactics, techniques, and procedures, which are also known as TTPs. And then we can stop, defend, prevent against these attacks in a better way. So the incident handling process is divided into four different phases, which we'll briefly go through before jumping into the incident. All right. So we have the preparation phase. So this phase covers the readiness of an organization against an attack. That means documenting the requirements, defining the policies, incorporating security controls to monitor like EDR, SIM, IDS, IPS, and it also includes hiring training the staff i think part of this process also involves having like you know your instant response your instant response rum books or playbooks whatever you know however they work in your organization as part of like you know this is what we're gonna do like when an incident happens stuff like that but i guess that kind of goes into hiring and training the staff as well so that's the first first phase and i think this is probably one of the most important phases of an incident because if you're not prepared for an incident when it happens like it could you know significantly be a lot worse i've been actually researching uh recently about like other adjacent fields and how they respond to incidents so i was recently like going through some material about how like you know organizations like i think the osha i think deal with like incidents you know how like firemen and you know emergency services deal with incidents um, i took some notes here and i kind of share them right here because i think a lot of times like you know we have these adjacent methodologies or theories that we can apply into cybersecurity in terms of like dealing with like our own things because we're not the only, only ones that deal with incidents right everybody deals with incidents like warehouses deal with incidents law enforcement deals with incidents paramedics deal with incidents fire people deal with incidents right so they they've probably been doing this like way longer than we have been they probably are doing this way better than we could ever do it so there's a lot we can actually gain from how they actually think about incidents and something that i took from that research i was doing was uh firstly when we are investigating incidents it's not to assign blame and shame but first for prevention because those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it i think this probably goes into like the the end of the incident response life cycle which is post incident activities or the lessons learned part of it because when you actually know what happened Happen and you're able to like kind of document it and know like you know the the issues whatever the case may be you can use that to prevent the incident from happening again or be better prepared when an incident like that happens so if you don't know history you're doomed to repeat history that's the first point second point is to identify policies and training deficiencies so um, as you can see here in a preparation phase right part of what you're doing is defining policies right so an incident could actually actually be like someone like breaking a policy so in this case you're able to identify right when you do your investigation and your incident response if the policies you're putting in place are actually being probably adhered to and also you, you, you're able to know if the training on cyber safety and different things are actually working in accordance to the policies that guide uh, how your employees do things so let's even take cybersecurity out of this in the first place right um and go into like you know someone that works in a very uh, like a construction sort of uh, environment right in a construction environment when you're working the policy states that you know i'm this is hypothetical by the way the policy states that you should always wear a harness if you're on a crane and also wear a, hel a helmet so what if you have someone who you know very new guy comes in he's wearing a helmet he's wearing gloves all of those things wearing like a you know a boot or whatever the case is but he's not wearing a harness right well it might not have been that he didn't want to adhere to the policy it might have been that the training didn't actually cover the policy that he should be wearing a harness and not just a helmet and a boot right so in that case as part of the incident, incident investigation and response preparation is tested here because you're seeing that your policies are not being even though they're defined they're not being adhered to and it can help you make sure that this person is doing what they're supposed to be doing and he do actually eventually have um, an incident so i think all of this kind of like feeds back into like both like the lessons learned and preparation because like if you remember um, once we looked at here it's you know it's it's cyber
click, right? They, they all feed back into each other. <laughs> That's enough about preparation. I do have a couple more points um, here, but you can go into that, into that later. All right, so we have next the detection analysis phase. And this is actually where I've spent most of my career. So this, if you're a suck analyst or, you know, like a tier one analyst, it's probably what you're going to be doing most of, you know, your work. You're going to be more in this phase of the life cycle. And this covers everything related to detecting an incident and the analysis of the incident. This phase covers getting alerts from the security controls like a SIM, an EDR, um, investigating the alert to find a root cause. And this phase also covers hunting for the unknown threat within your organization. So there's a lot that actually goes on in this phase, but it typically, you know, is, you know, from like that, you know, alerts, you know, like, you know, what you do, what you're doing as a tier one, where you get, you know, the alert from the SIM, whatever the case is, you kind of do your triage. And then if there's anything, you can then escalate to like, you know, the seniors or like, you know, the instant responders. Um, they also say this also covers some hunting. So if you do find something during like a hunting expenditure or, you know, uh, something like that, um, this could also, you know, be part of your detection and analysis, right? Because it's like the first, you know, sort of like way by which you're able to identify that something has happened, something bad or something probably bad might have happened, right? So that's the detection and analysis phase. Next, we have the containment eradication and recovery phase. So this is actually the part of instant response that I wanted to learn more about because a lot of my career for like the, you know, the last three, four years, I've been mostly focused on, you know, detection and analysis. But I also wanted to learn how to do containment, how to do eradication, how to do recovery, right? Uh, that's kind of why I, you know, started looking for a new role and, you know, got into my, my, my current role, you know, part of the containment, right? So if, if you think about, you know, sort of like in, in a nuclear, you know, there's a nuclear, let's think of like a, a nuclear bomb in this case, right? I don't mean to be all, <laughs> I don't mean to like use, you know, something like that devastating, but when something like that happens, right? It's like, okay, how do we contain, you know, this area, right? If, if you went to movies, like contain the area so it doesn't spread beyond that. Because if it spreads beyond that, there's, you know, more loss of life, more degradation of the environment. But if you're able to contain it to like this small area, you're kind of able to like make sure that, okay, like, we can just like focus on this because the bigger it gets, the, the, the harder it is for us to deal with it. So we want to make sure we don't let it spread beyond what it is at. Now eradication is like, okay, now we've contained this like nuclear, you know, whatever, you know, area <laughs> that we're dealing with. How do we, how do we actually like, I don't know, like diffuse the bomb or how do we like actually like make sure that this, you know, nuclear waste or whatever it is, like, you know, just ends here, right? I don't know, maybe you use some anti-nuclear thing to clear it out, but it's cybersecurity. It's like, okay, how do we, if the attacker is present within this contained environment, how do we kick them out? How do we like, you know, put them off? How do we make sure like they no longer have access? And then when they no longer have access, recovery goes over, okay, how do we make sure we get this system back to its working state? How do we get this business function back to its working state? How do we make sure that, you know, things can go back to, to normal now that we've taken out the attacker and then no longer have access and there's no spread in the network, right? How do we make sure that we go back to business operations as usual? That's where the recovery phase comes back. So it's a whole lot of, it's a whole lot of things. It's a whole process, but containment, eradication, and recovery kind of entirely embody those different things. All right, next we have the post-incident activity lessons learned. Learned. Uh, it sounds like someone that is from Europe because the Americans like to say learned. <laughs> but this phase includes identifying the loopholes in the organization's security posture, which led to an intrusion and improving so that the attack does not happen next time. The steps involved identifying weaknesses that led to the attack, adding detection rules to that so that a similar breach does not happen again, and most importantly, training the staff if required. Now, I, I do want to add something onto this, right? Because incidents come with loss, right? Uh, when you when you have an incident, there's you lose something, right? You lose time, you lose manpower, you lose money sometimes, right? You lose good reputation. One of the primary goals of a business, whatever the business is, whatever it is, whether whether they're, they're in for for profit for profit or not for profit, is to not lose, is reducing loss. So it's like by any means we can't lose, <laughs> like we should not be losing. So when you have an incident, you're losing, you're losing time, you're losing money, you're losing reputation, you're losing you know manpower, right? A lot of things are being lost. So when you have incidents, your goal is to make sure that they don't happen again. Because if if, if this happens all the time, think about it. If you think about it to like something like the MGM attack, right? I was watching a documentary yesterday about how MGM was losing like millions of dollars a day from the attack alone. And this is aside from like what the attackers might have actually like stole from them, whatever the case may be, but they were losing millions just from just from not having any operations. They're losing millions of dollars a day, but that's not just what they're losing. They're losing the reputation, right? What has happened? They're probably going to lose even more, except if there's like a monopoly, right? But they're gonna, probably going to lose more in reputation because people are not going to want to deal with them because you didn't protect my credit card information, personal information. I probably wasn't safe in the hotel because like all these attackers had access to everything. So that's a loss of rotation. They've lost a lot from that attack. So the goal is to not always to maximize profit, but to reduce loss. Whenever you have an incident, you're losing a lot of things, which, you know, is kind of in inevitable, but ultimately not for it to happen again. 